we can start soon. So good morning and warm welcome to one and all to the online anesthesia post graduate teaching program on Zoom platform. Sponsored by Acrylla and uh, posted by Avon Logics. Today we have two interesting topics. The first topic is interpretation of ECG by Dr. Sarva Vinodini. Her lectures are very famous among the postgraduates. And the second uh, topic is interpretation of X ray chest by Professor S. Partha Sarandi. He is a legendary postgraduate teacher. He has agreed to take a series of classes in the uh, forthcoming online anesthesia from next month onwards. With a small introduction, I hand over the session to today's session coordinator, Dr. Santini, Madam. Thank you. Over to Santini, Madam. Uh, today, I introduce uh, Dr. Sarvaji Nodri, Ma'am. Uh, she is working as a consultant anesthesiologist in New York International Hospital. She is going to talk on uh, interpretation of ECG. Uh, this is a very important topic. Please pay, please pay full attention because uh, it's uh, very important for our Viva uh, session. Uh, so it's rarely discussed as a separate session during our uh, the UG or PG period. So I welcome Dr. Sarvari Nadini, ma'am. Over to you, ma'am. Good morning, everyone. Today's session is regarding the interpretation of the ECG, the basics. Uh, this session is designed to aid the exam going PGs uh, who, who might have the ECGs given in their uh, OSCEs or in uh, their Viva OC. So, and few tips and tricks regarding the interpretation of ECG. We all know regarding the conduction system of the heart, which begins in the SA node and ends in the Purkinje fiber. Not just each cell in the conduction system, in fact, each myocardial cell has an intrinsic automaticity. Because SA node fires at a rapid rate, SA node is the dominant pacemaker of the heart. The cardiac cycle is in close relation with the ECG. The uh, P wave represents the atrial depolarization, the PR interval represents the AV nodal delay, and the QRS complex represents the ventricular uh, depolarization, and the T wave represents the ventricular repolarization. The 12 leads act as the 12 cameras in the ECG. The six uh, limb leads view the heart in the sagittal plane, and the six chest leads view the heart in the coronal plane. Hence, we have a 360 degree view of the heart. And uh, the each lead in an uh, ECG uh, depicts specific regions. Two, three AVF depict the inferior region of the heart and one and AVL depict the high lateral region of the heart, V1 and V2 depict the uh, septum, V3 and V4 the anterior wall, and V5 and V6 the lateral wall. The mean electrical axis of the heart is the summation of numerous vectors in the heart, and the mean axis is between 0 to 90 degrees. So when the wave of depolarization occurs in this direction, and when there are numerous measuring electrodes, so if the electrode uh, is here, and if the wave of depolarization uh, goes on to Towards this electrode, then this electrode records a positive deflection in the ECG. And uh, if the wave of depolarization is going to go away from this, uh, away from an electrode, it records a negative deflection in the ECG. And if the wave of depolarization traverses along these electrodes, we get a biphasic waveform in the ECG. Thus, we have different morphology in different leads. Because the uh, QRS complex is always, uh, the mean electrical axis is always away from the measuring AVR electrode, all the waves in AVR are usually negative. There is only dextrocardia where the waves in AVR will be positive. So this can also be a guide for the proper placement of the ECG. So we know to we should know to interpret our ECG paper also before knowing to interpret the ECG. So each small square in the ECG paper represents 0.04 seconds and each large square represents 0.2 two seconds. Uh, the ECG is usually swept in a speed of 25 millimeters per second and the standardization is 10 millimeters representing 1 millivolt. Two large squares represent 1 millivolt. So always look for the standardization and the standard sweep speed on the ECG. 
the seven steps that are uh, used to determine the ecg are the rate and the rhythm which go hand in hand followed by the p wave pr interval qrs complex st and others so how do you determine the rate in an ecg the rate is determined by determining the number of large boxes or number of small squares that are present between two qrs complex so if you are going to use large boxes it's going to be 300 divided by the number of large boxes or 1500 divided by the number of small boxes between two uh, two qrs complex so if there are four large boxes the rate is going to be 300 divided by 4 that is 75 if it's going to be two large boxes the rate is going to be 150 per minute then coming on to the rhythm as we saw earlier the rate and the rhythm go hand in hand so we have to determine first the rhythm is regular or not we'll have to see if each p wave is being followed by the qrs complex and if the rr intervals are constant in that case we can use our previous formula 300 divided by the number of uh, large boxes between two qrs complex and we get your heart rate what if the rr intervals are not constant in that case we'll have to determine the number of qrs complexes that are present in uh, 30 large boxes which amounts to 6 seconds and multiply that by 10 to get a mean heart rate. So having known the rate and the rhythm, we are going, just going to focus on the rate and the rhythm in the following ECGs. So what about the uh, rhythm? The RR interval occurs constant and each P wave is being followed by the QRS complex. So the rhythm is regular and what about the rate? There are 3.5 large boxes so it's going to be 300 divided by 3.5. The rate is 85 per minute and the rhythm is regular so this is a normal ECG. Coming on to the next ECG, we're just going to focus on the rate and the rhythm. The RR interval occurs at a, at a constant intervals and each P is being followed by the QRS complex. And what about the rate? There are six large boxes. So it's going to be 300 divided by six. The rate is 50 and the rhythm is regular. So this is sinus bradycardia. Again, just focus on the rate and the rhythm. What do we see here? Each P wave is being followed by the QRS complex. And what about the uh, RR intervals. We can see that the RR intervals are wide here and they are narrow here. So the RR intervals are varying. So it is irregular. But if you carefully observe, we can see there is some regularity in this irregularity also. So it is wider RR interval followed by narrow RR interval and again wider RR interval. So if this has got a relation with respiration, then we can brand this as sinus arrhythmia. Sinus arrhythmia uh, is common in uh, asymptomatic ENG males uh, usually who have vagal predominance so that this there is a variation that occurs in the heart rate in uh, relation to respiration so uh, during inspiration the heart rate increases and during expiration the heart rate decreases so this is called a sinus arrhythmia so having seen the rate and the rhythm now we're going to look at the p wave so when you are going to look at the p wave you'll have to remember this always look for p wave in lead two and always remember 2.5 into 2.5 so a p wave usually occupies uh, a, a height of 2.5 millimeter and usually occupies a width of around 2.5 small squares so always remember this and the p wave is because of the atrial uh, depolarization. So the first half is represented by the right atrial depolarization and the second half by the left atrial depolarization. So what happens if there is a right atrial endangerment? Then the first half of the wave is affected and hence the amplitude increases and the P wave height will become more than 2.5 millimeter and we get to have a tall or uh, uh, peaked P wave that is called as a P pulmonary which is pathognomonic and it is characteristic of a right atrial enlargement. What happens if the left atrium is enlarged? Then the second half of the PV will be affected. So we tend to have a broader PV or a wide PV and a bifid or a notched PV. This is indicative of left atrial enlargement. This is also called as P-mitral. This is commonly seen in mitral stenosis. Apart from this, we can have an inverted P wave, a polymorphic P wave, or flutter waves, fibrillatory waves, or an absent P wave. So we're going to concentrate on the rate, the rhythm, and the P wave now. So what about the rate? The rate is very high here. And uh, what about the rhythm? The RR intervals are not constant. We don't see constant RR intervals here. So it is an irregular rhythm. And what about the P waves? We do see P waves before each QRS complex, but we can see the P waves are actually different. We see many different kinds of P waves here. So the P waves are actually polymorphic. And this is called as a polymorphic atrial tachycardia, or multifocal atrial tachycardia, which is common in patients with lung symptoms like COPD and uh, increased sputum production, etc. So what is multifocal atrial tachycardia? Here, different sites 
in the atria generate impulse uh, at different points of time so depending upon where the impulse originates the morphology of the previa varies accordingly so to brand this as a multifocal atrial tachycardia we should be able to demonstrate uh, at least three different types of p waves in a uh, in a patient with tachycardia so this is common in patients with lung diseases and what do we see here again the rate seems to be more but the rhythm seems to be regular and what about the p waves we don't find any p waves but this is not atrial fibrillation because we don't find any p waves because the rhythm is regular so you have a regular rhythm with an absent p wave actually the p waves are buried under this uh, qrs later qrs later part of the qrs complex or the p waves so this is supraventricular tachycardia here the Uh, QRS complexes are occurring at regular intervals, and what about the P waves? We don't see any isoelectric line at all. All that we see here are like picket fins or sawtooth appearance, and all these are P waves. But the uh, but the QRS complexes are occurring at a regular intervals. This, this picket fins or sawtooth pattern is characteristic of atrial flutter, and because it the because here this patient has a fixed AV block, so for every three P wave, one QRS complex is generated. So because the AV block is fixed, we tend to have a regular rhythm. So this is an atrial flutter with three is to one AV block. So for the atrial rate is two hundred and sixteen, the ventricular rate is seventy two. So for every three P waves, you get one QRS complex. So again, this is an atrial flutter with a fixed AV block. This is also atrial flutter. We have a similar sort of the picket fence pattern, but we see here that the RR interval is varying compared to this where the RR interval was same. We have a varying RR interval here. So this rhythm is irregular because the AV block uh, AV block is variable. So this is an atrial flutter with a variable av block what is atrial flutter in atrial flutter we do have an ectopic site in the atria which keeps firing at around 250 to 350 times per minute so depending upon how the av block is whether it's fixed or varying we tend to have a uh, regular or an irregular rhythm what do we find here here the rhythm is irregular the rr intervals are occurring at uh, the rr intervals are not constant it is varying so we have an irregular rhythm and what about the p waves we don't find any distinct p waves instead we find a fibrillating baseline so this is indicative of atrial fibrillation what happens here multiple sites in the atria fire at larger uh, 350 times per minute and the atria just just fibrillates so there's no proper contraction of the atria to generate a p wave so the atria just fibrillates and uh, we tend to have a fibrillating baseline or an absent p wave having seen the rate rhythm and the p wave next is going to be the pr interval the pr interval occurs because of the intrinsic delay in the conduction of the impulse in the av node this is essential for the atria to completely empty the blood into the ventricle and for the ventricle to be completely filled before it begins to contract so this intrinsic delay is normal so what all can happen in the pr interval this can become short when there is any accessory pathway like wpw syndrome or lon ganong levin syndrome or it can be prolonged or it can be variable so So now we have to concentrate on the rate, rhythm, P wave, and the PR interval. So what about the rate? It seems to be like tachycardia. Rhythm. There's a P followed by QRS complex, and the PR intervals are occurring at regular uh, intervals. So the rhythm is regular. And what about the PR interval? The PR interval is very short. And what the and we can see a slurring QRS complex that is occurring. So this is pathognomonic of WPW syndrome. What happens in WPW syndrome when an impulse is normally conducted in AV node? There is a delay in AV node, which gives which gives rise to this PR interval. But what happens here? The impulse starts though the impulse is delayed here in AV node. The impulse takes the, the impulse takes this accessory pathway and it and it uh, gets transmitted to the ventricles. So the PR interval is actually shortened, and because the ventricles are being depolarized via this accessory pathway, you have a slurring upstroke of this QRS complex. So the triad of WPW syndrome can be remembered using WPW itself: a delta wave, shorter PR interval, and a wider QRS complex. Uh, if there is any re-entry that is happening via this accessory pathway. depending upon the direction of the reentry circuit we can have an uh, qrs complex as an orthodromic or antidromic conduction 
to sum up, all the tachycardias of atrial origin will have a narrow QRS complex, except for WPW syndrome, which doesn't have a wide QRS complex, it just has a slurring upstroke of the uh, QRS complex. So always remember, all the tachycardias of atrial origin will have a narrow QRS complex, and the rhythm can be regular or irregular depending upon the kind of the arrhythmia and depending upon the kind of the AV block that is present. So what do we see here? So we see here that the uh, the RR intervals are occurring at constant uh, uh, regular intervals. So the rhythm is regular and we do have a P wave. But what we find here is the PR interval is prolonged. The uh, PR interval should usually be around 0.12 to 0.2 seconds. So it should usually occupy only one large box. So we see here that the PR interval is prolonged in each of the beats and it is constant. So this is a first degree AV block. In first degree AV block, the intrinsic AV nodal delay, uh, which is physiological, becomes pathological. So that there's a further increase in the delay. So the PR interval is prolonged and it is constant through, throughout each beat. So that is the first degree AV block, which is a fixed PR prolongation. What happens here, this patient is a 55 year old patient who's posted for TERP and this is his ECG. Uh, what, what we can see here is, we do see uh, the RR intervals being regularly irregular. And what about the P waves? So we can see there is a pre-IPR prolongation the next P wave is even more prolonged and then you have a P wave which is not followed by QRS complex and the cycle continues. So you have a wider uh, PR interval, even wider PR interval and you have a dropped beat. So this is Mobitz type 1 or uh, second degree AV block type 1 also called as a Menke back phenomenon. How do we remember this? We can remember this as sequential widening of the PR leading on to one drop beat. So second degree AV block, Menke back phenomenon, Mobitz type 1. So sequential widening of the PR eventually leading on to one drop beat. So it conducts with delay, it conducts with even more delay and eventually leads to a, eventually fails to conduct and leads to a dropped beat. It's a 40 year old male with occasional episodes of fainting. So what we can find here, the rhythm is uh, irregular and we have P wave followed by QRS complex, but then we have P waves which are not followed by QRS complex also. So this is uh, a second degree AV block type 2, wherein you have uh, the P waves, the PR interval, P waves is the normal PR interval and the P waves which are not followed by QRS complex. So in type 2, you have two different types of P waves. One P wave, which is normally conducted, hence has, hence has got a normal PR interval. And the other kind of P wave, which is uh, not followed by QRS uh, complex and hence turns uh, and hence is a dropped beat. So you have two types of P waves. This patient has an 80 year old patient who has broken her hip and uh, the surgeon wants to operate this patient. So what is our comment here? What do we see here? We see here that the RR uh, interval, we, we see some bradycardia here and the RR interval is fairly okay. Uh, but what about the P waves? We see numerous P waves when compared to the R waves. Okay, so this the, there is total discordance between the P and the QRS. So this is indicative of complete or third degree heart block. So we shouldn't take this patient up for surgery now. This patient requires a uh, temporary or at least a uh, permanent or at least a temporary basic immediately. So what happens in complete heart block? The impulses from the ATR are completely blocked. They are not going to the uh, ventricles at all. And then how does the QRS originate? It originates because of an escape rhythm that uh, depending upon where the escape rhythm originates, the QRS complex can be narrow or wide. Uh, does this AV block teach us life lesson? If we consider this as a normal rhythm of life, uh, the P and uh, the QRS as the wife and the husband and the PR interval is a relationship between them. The first degree AV block uh, represents a strain in their relationship where the distance between the P and the QRS increases. So that way the PR interval increases and it is constant. So still they are in that relationship. What happens in second degree AV block? The PR interval progressively increases and eventually there is a drop beat. So eventually the Q, uh, the QRS goes out of the circle. In the uh, second degree AV block type 2, the, whenever there is a P, the, though the PR interval seems to be normal, uh, there are frequent dropped beats because the QRS has gone out of the circle. Here the QRS was just in the circle. So the PR interval is progressively increasing, then a dropped beat, then again the cycle continues. But here the, the number of P waves will be more than the number of QRS complexes and the PR interval will be normal 
or the p wave will be a dropped beat here there is total discordance between the p and the qrs complex so having seen till the pr interval now we are going to see the qrs complex the qrs complex represents the ventricular depolarization it is usually represented by three small squares and uh, less than 120 milliseconds in duration the qrs complex is the primary determinant of the cardiac axis what are the problems that can occur we can have a wide qrs complex or a tall qrs complex always remember in a tachycardia if the qrs complex is narrow then the origin of tachycardia is above the ventricle if the origin of tachycardia is is in the ventricle then definitely you have a wide qrs complex the other reason for the wide qrs complex is bundle branch block and the qrs can be tall when there is ventricular hypertrophy so what do we see here our concentration is going to be on the qrs complex uh, we see that the rate is more and the rhythm seems to be regular we don't find any p wave so no pr uh, interval also and the qrs complexes are wide it is more than three small squares so this is ventricular tachycardia this is also a kind of ventricular tachycardia but the difference here is we have varying amplitude and varying axis of the qrs complexes so this can be uh, with the outline con outline of these things will resemble the outline of a party streamer so this is called as torsade deep pointers this occurs in patients with long qt syndrome or when there is any r and t phenomenon so this is the difference in monomorphic ventricular tachycardia all the complexes are wide but they they appear similar but in uh, torsade deep points we can see that there is varying uh, amplitude and varying axis of the qrs complex this is common in patients with channelopathy and there is rot phenomenon so what do we find here we cannot actually make out any distinct waves at all so this is ventricular fibrillation this is an emergency the patient has to be uh, defibrillated how is the qrs complex actually formed the initial depolarization forms the first stage of the qrs complex and the initial depolarization uh, occurs first in the septum it occurs from the left to the right so it, it it records as a positive deflection in v1 and a negative deflection in v6 then because the left ventricle has more muscle the left ventricle has more influence so the right and the left bundle branch uh, lies in the left bundle branches transmit the uh, depolarization current but because the left ventricle has more muscle that has more influence so you you record we see the recording as a predominant uh, negative deflection in v1 and predominant positive deflection in v6 and ultimately it returns to the baseline so uh, we can see a gradual progression of the r wave from v1 to v6 and the transition point that is where it is uh, biphasic is usually between v3 and v4 so this is a normal progression of r wave if there is right ventricular hypertrophy there will be poor progression of the r wave and the transition point will be somewhere around v5 or v6 so the small q in uh, v5 and v6 is physiological when do we term it as pathological we term it as pathological when the duration occupied by the uh, q is more than two, three small squares or an, and, or when the height is more than one third of the qrs complex so as we saw this is how the normal uh, qrs complex is generated when there is a right bundle branch block what happens because the septal depolarization occurs from left to right that is not affected so the the first part of the wave is not affected and because left ventricle mass constitutes the major uh, portion of the qrs complex and uh, the second wave is also predominantly because of the left ventricular depolarization so that is also not affected the first and second part is not affected but because the right bundle branch is blocked the right, the right part of the ventricle has now to be depolarized via the myocardial cells so not via the conduction system so it is going to take longer time and hence we tend to have another r prime in the uh, v1 or a broader s wave in v6 if it is difficult for you to remember this we can remember this as m in v1 and w in v6 that is significant of your right bundle branch block what happens in left bundle branch block if there is left bundle branch block the first part itself will not happen because the septal depolarization has to happen from the left to the right so that itself is not going to happen so you are not going to have have the first initial r wave or the initial q wave in v1 and v6 so what we are going to have is the second part that is going to be crossly prolonged so you're going to have a wide wide and deep s wave and broad and uh, broad r wave because the whole of the left left ventricle mass has to be depolarized uh, via the myocytes and not via the conduction system so we tend to have uh, w 
in V1 or an M in V6, that is significant of a left bundle branch block. So we want to concentrate on the QRS here. What do we see here? We can see RSR pattern in V1 to V3 and a slurring in V6. So this is indicative of right bundle branch block. And here we can see the uh, broad R wave or the M pattern in V5 and V6 and the sort of W pattern in V1 to V3 and in V3 and also this is indicative of left bundle branch block. How do we determine the chamber hypertrophy? There are numerous criteria. It might be difficult for us to remember all the numbers when you're going for exam. So it can easily remember as if it's right ventricular hypertrophy, the R in the V1 should be more than seven. And the uh, if it's left ventricular hypertrophy, the R in the V6 should be at least four times of this. So it should be at least 26 or 28 if you, if you want to remember it easily. So if the R in V1 is more than 7 millimeter, it's uh, right ventricular hypertrophy. The R in V5 or 6 is more than 26 millimeter, it's left ventricular hypertrophy. And uh, we'll be having the reciprocal uh, things of the S wave in the reciprocal leads. So we'll have a deep S wave in V5 and V6. And we're going to have a deep S wave in V1 and V2 in patients with left ventricular hypertrophy. Other associated findings will be the appropriate axis deviations and the bundle branch flow. And, and in addition, as we saw earlier, we'll have a poor R wave progression in RVH and a delayed intensive quad deflection in LVH. So the axis is usually determined by taking lead one and AVF into account. This is your normal axis. This is left axis deviation. This is right axis deviation. So we usually take into consideration the lead one and uh, AVF. You can use you can use the thumb rule, or we can uh, see the uh, axis the axis in the ECG itself. So we can remember this by usually uh, in the normal axis, both the QRS axis, the QRS uh, complex in lead one and AVF will be pointing up. So it will be predominantly pointing up. But what happens if there isn't right axis deviation? The both, both the QRS complexes will be reaching each other. So lead one and AVF will be reaching each other. And if it is left axis deviation, they'll be leaving away from each other. So right reaches and left leaves. So you can use this as a mnemonic for uh, right axis deviation, left axis deviation. So what do we see here? We see here that the QRS complexes, both the QRS complexes are reaching each other. So this is right axis deviation. And here both the QRS complexes in lead one and AVF are moving away from each other. So they're leaving. So this left axis deviation. So what do we see here? Here we can see tall R waves and what about the axis lead one and AVF? What happens here? They both are reaching each other, just right axis deviation. So this is right ventricular hypertrophy. And what do we see here? Predominantly tall uh, R waves in V5 and V6. And what about the axis V1 and AVF? They are moving away from each other, leaving each other. So it is left axis, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. So having seen till the QRS, now we are going to see the ST. So ST segment elevation indicates myocardial ischemia. So we all we already saw the regions that are depicted in the ECG. So it uh, not just depicts the regions, it in fact depicts the arteries supplying those regions also. So lead 2, 3 and AVF changes can occur when right coronary artery is uh, involved. So in uh, leads V1 to V4, there can be ST segment changes when left anterior descending artery is obstructed or, or uh, occluded. Um, and uh, the changes that can occur in the lateral leads when the diagonal branch of left anterior descending artery are the left circumflex arteries involved. So uh, if left circumflex or diagonal branch is involved, we can see the changes in lead 1 AVL or V5 and V6 and 2, 3 AVF are pathognomonic of right coronary artery involvement. So what we can see here in the ST segment, we can see an ST segment elevation occurring in V2 to uh, V5. This is actually called a storm shaped elevation. It is, uh, this carries high mortality. So this is an anterolateral ischemia. You can see the reciprocal changes also happening in the uh, inferior leads. We can see an ST elevation here occurring in leads 2, 3 and AVF. So this is an inferior wall myocardial ischemia. This is usually associated with bradycardia. Having seen till the ST, the last part will be to evaluate the QT and the U waves. So what do we see here? Here we have a normal P wave, normal PR interval. The rhythm is regular. Everything is fine, but the QT is prolonged. So how do we determine the QT interval? The QT interval has to be corrected to the heart rate. So that is called as the corrected QT interval. That is the Bessitz formula. That is QT interval divided by the uh, RR interval. So the QT interval here is around 0.6 seconds and the RR interval is around 
one second. So the QT interval is around 600 milliseconds. The normal QT interval is around 450 to 480 milliseconds in females and males. So here it is prolonged. This prolonged QT interval can lead to the torsatic points or the polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. And what about the relation between serum potassium and ECG? A hypokalemia, because it is a lower level, we can remember as hypokalemia depressing the ST segment. The hypokalemia will depress the ST segment, will cause T wave inversion and a prominent U wave. The hyperkalemia, because it indicates a rise in potassium level, it will pinch the ST segment. So you tend to have, so hyperkalemia will depress the ST segment, this is going to pinch up the uh, ST segment. So you tend to have tall, tented, peaked T waves. And that because of the pinching up, eventually you have a QRS prolongation, flattening of the uh, P waves and PR prolongation, ultimately sine wave pattern can arise. So this is a 60 year old on furosemide. What do we see here? We can see that there is an uh, ST depression and a T wave inversion and the prominent U waves that can be seen. So this is indicative of hypokalemia. And this is a patient who missed his last session of dialysis. What we can see here is tall peaked tinted T waves. So which is pathognomonic of hyperkalemia. If left untreated, this can lead on to the sine wave pattern and eventually ventricular fibrillation. So these are the seven steps that we have to follow. The rate, the rhythm, the P wave, Thank you, ma'am. Uh, because uh, huge amount of information in a very short time, you have covered every important point in ECT. Uh, thank you very much, ma'am. So, uh, there's no doubts in the chat box. Uh, because of the short duration, we will go on with the next session, and the doubts will be answered in the chat box. Uh, so, the next session is interpretation of the text case by Dr. Patricia Dieter. Interpretation of the text case means to separate session, actually. So, Sir is an epitome of an avid learning and adaptive teaching and Christian practice. He was a team learner at school and continued the same during graduation of Punjabi and PGI at Business. In his best for uh, out of work, he has studied acupuncture, computer applications, and statistics. He also holds DMD in anesthesia, PhD in physiology, diploma in diabetology, regional anesthesia, and echocardiography. And at present, he is a uh, professor of uh, anesthesia at Mahatma Gandhi Medical College and Research Institute of Pudicherry. He is well known for his teaching through his website, Time Free Pata, and Fridays every week in Zoom. So, we are eager to uh, learn uh, the interpretation of his text from you, sir. Welcome, sir. Whenever I talk anything on academics, I put a big salute to the legendary teacher of two centuries, Professor Ravishan, who is currently the director of e learning in Mahatma Gandhi College. Now, wherever you start reading an X-ray, don't go straight. See whether it's the right patient, what we are seeing. Whether the patient is Gopal, Ramu, or Shanti. Is it the right position? Or is the overall the patient is fine? For example, the patient is sick like this with the ICD. How is the patient? Just get to know all these things before going on to read this. AP or PA comes up. Because just ask the sister, ask somebody else, we know that this is. AP or PA because this is a previous day AP while this is a you can see this is the previous day same patient next day PA now the start interpretation see here left side because people may be very particular in diagnostic test cardiac X-ray test so beware this is left side now this is the medial letter the clavic Medial end of the clavic in the center, and the trachea and the vertebra is in the center. It is not rotated like this, like this. Then it means it is centrally placed. Medial end of the clavicle, yes, you can see this is what is called this position. This Closer with the clavicle weighter, that is why we should do this. Now you can see this is the left rotation. The left lung looks a little wider. You can see it's a left rotation. Now go to the, now we can see what is the patient, right? Which is the, uh, we have checked the left or right, and which patient is AP or PA, and rotation is there or not there. When you go to the X-ray, if we check at the lower part of the X cardiac shadow, spine should be just visible. No clear demarcation. Spine's not at all visible, means it is under rotation. 
under see here it is nothing is seen here something is seen here and you can see nothing is seen or other if we go to t4 level there you can see very clearly the upper and lower border of the vertebra then it means the exposure is over if you are not able to see the upper and lower border of the vertebra then it is under exposed overall we should see the x-ray here you can see if there is going to be a tp in the apex it is missed this x-ray is fine but it is missed here now you can see there is no right cpac if there is a pleural effusion here we might very well miss this right cp angle is not at all shown in the x now i will go whether the x ray is taken in inspiration or expiration we want x ray just in inspiration sixth rib is anterior that is what is here should be seen was anterior this is anterior this is posterior anterior 1 2 3 4 5 6 So this is okay. This is taken in inspiration. A ninth rib is posterior. We not if no if it is not taken properly in deep inspiration, the heart may show it should be there, and basal shadows may be there. So that is why here I am showing the anterior ribs. So this is the posterior ribs, and this is the anterior ribs. So we have got patient name, site, position, exposure, rotation, inspiration, or expiration. Now, what are the things to start from? Soft tissue, bones, medial spine, angles, heart and vessels, and lungs. Go methodical. There is no miss many things. Now, for example, if you have not looked at exactly the lungs only, heart is damaged and all, you will clearly miss this. Beautiful emphasis, my dear. We will miss so go methodical, right from the soft tissue. Now you can see the bones, scapula. Now you can see round of fracture ribs is there. These are multiple fracture ribs. If you are not going methodical, the soft tissue, then bones, you are likely to miss fractures. See. Bones were among the scapula, Pato. Then we saw this uh, ribs. Then see here, the scoliosis is so much. If there is so much of scoliosis, we should interpret this first because if there is so much of scoliosis, we may interpret this as disease. We may interpret this as disease and all. So just see the bones. Now after seeing the bones, we will come back. We will come to the costophrenic angles. The diaphragm. This is. Osteophrenic and this is cardiophrenic. This is cardiophrenic and costophrenic. See, this is this angle is not at all here. I just point is the middle of the lung field, right? Right at the uh, highest point is the middle of the highest point is this. Highest point is little lateral here of the left side. There should be a smooth contour. All these things should be seen. Because if the diaphragm is not smooth, diagnosis is different. If there is a subdiaphragmatic air shadow, the diagnosis is different. So this is fine or not. Cardiophrenic and costophrenic angles should be seen. Diaphragm should be seen. Usually, the left CP angle is the too low. Now, CT ratio is a fifty percent. If it is above, then it is cardiac. Now we have to be very clear in how to measure this. This is the maximum bulge on the right side. The maximum bulge length you have to go to the midpoint of the vertebra, and then again, where is the maximum bulge on the heart here? Here it is there. So we have to make plus this plus, and then the more than this, the half of this, then it is called more cardiac. Cardio transmission. Is more than fifty percent. It is just not like this. It is like this plus this should be more than fifty percent of this. So here there is a medial span. There is a small fussiness here. Now we have got this, and uh, we have got 
know this, then we go to the media stand. Iorca. Then we get the other reaction. This is, I am on the left side. This is the left eight here. Then we can see the left twenty. So on the left side, it's an exam question. Iorca, pulmonary artery, LA, LV. That we should tell. In the right side, it is SVC plus RE. That is what we should tell in a normal X-ray. But many times, if you get the same picture for identification, prominent aortic nacre. You can see here, prominent aortic nacre. We can see here, this is a left atrium is not, this bay is not coming. Now we can see the left atrial bulge. Now this is somewhat some sort of pulmonary hypertension. There is a left atrial enlargement and there is also a left ventricular enlargement. Now this here you can see the see the first one, SVC. Area of the anosoma, right atrium. SVC is also slightly prominent and the right atrium is enlarged. If you want to see. Then now it is media sign up over. Now we will go up to the trachea. Now the trachea is in the midline, no, it is shifted to the right. Before that, you see here, it's not correctly positioned. That is another thing. With the trachea, where is the media sign up? Here it is pushed. Now we know rotation, exposure, soft tissue, cones, media sign up, trachea, angles. Then we will go to the lung paracrine. This is what is the time we should go to the lungs. It is not that immediately we see pneumonia right side, pneumonia left side, pleural effusion left side, nothing like that. You should see it's a rotation, exposure, soft tissue, bones, mediastinum, trachea, and now what I call is upper zone is not equal to upper low. Second costal cartilage to the axilla. The middle zone is second to four, and the lower zone is below four. Now you can see here. This is what is the upper zone. This is the middle zone. And this is the lower zone. Whenever you are commenting any disease here, we should tell it is in the lower zone and not in the lower lobe because we don't know where is it. Sometimes this may be upper lobe also. So we should comment it is in the lower zone, middle zone, upper zone. Sometimes some disc has got three lobes. This may not have three lobes. But zones are different. Reminder, all these things are anterior, not posterior. See here, anterior ribs. Second and fourth. Third and fourth. See here, this is the anterior rib. What is there in this? Whenever we explain this, we should tell whether it's an homogeneous or heterogeneous mass. Here you can see it's an homogeneous mass. Pulipulia gap gap by white and black lab. It's a homogeneous structure. Here is the sign. It is in the right lower zone. This angle, mediastinum is okay, trachea is okay. Their angle is not very much completely abolished. There is something here. So it is less likely to be fluid. So it is possibly a lower lobe division. Now you can see here the medias, the trachea is behind the mediastinum is completely pushed. And there are normal vasculature here is complete, no shadows. This is what is called a pneumothorax. Here also we can see a small pneumothorax here. There are no bronchovascular particles. This is what is very important whenever you determine a hyperechoic shadow with push of the mediastinum. Now you see, I have already told four things ago. Upper zone, mid zone, lower zone. Now this is in the upper zone. Upper zone, now we can see as a homogeneous shadow. A homogeneous shadow, the trachea is slightly pulled. Maybe the pull of the trachea may be a collapse. The collapse of the possible collapse of the armor. Now you see the trachea is pushed here, pulled like this. Mediastinum is irregular. A big cavity here, a lot of infiltrates here also there is some cavity. Yes, it looks like an active tumor process. Here you can see this 
It does not. It doesn't look like it. The, here you can see the, the diaphragm is not very regular. The contour, so called, this thing is not there. The contour is not bulged like this. All these things possibly, maybe, here yeah, you can see, this is what is a case of silicosis. Here you can see, if you miss like this, but obviously, it is very well. Directly operating you want to accept my do at my do at my think like this directly seeing the long shadows. Yes, you are likely to miss a perspiration. Here you can see flat, irregular diaphragm, complete emphysematous lens. This is like slightly tubular part. Now it is likely to be emphysematous. Now, this is, you can see here, a lemming epushet may think that it is a collapse. Here, you can see this is also lifted up. There is a confusion. That is why we should always see the history and other patient overall, because this patient has had a history of surgery left front. So, it's a case of pneumonectomy. Some lifelines can also be assessed. Central line, tracheostomy, nasogastric tubes, endotracheal tubes. See, this is a tracheal tube. Here you can see this five lines coming like this. Again, you can see here central lines here. Nasogastric tube is here. Pacing wires, all these things can also be seen. In X ray test. What is this? Looks like normal, or here there is nothing is seen. Is it exposed normally? Here you can see this clavicle is normal, bones looks normal, expiratory filling. Yes, that is a problem in that case. Right sided chest spine and cough. You can see a small. Air yeah, shadow here. There is see here the bronchovascular markings are well seen. This bronchovascular markings are not well seen. Probably an excited pneumothorax. A conflict fever. Now we can see this is slightly shifted to the right. It may be okay, but it is normal. Mediastinum looks normal. Drug is normal. All this is normal. But a heterogeneous shadow occupying the upper and middle zones. And there is no shift much of this. This is looking like a fever and a possible pneumonia. Now we can see there are two x rays. This x ray, we can see this mediastinum is completely shifted to the left. There is a big homogeneous shadow, completely, obviously, obliterating the right chemothorax completely. So this is pushing. Push was complete obliteration. Complete homogeneous white shadow, obliteration of the angles, it is likely to be an exhibition. But here you can see complete white shadow, that even though it is there, there are some black here and there shadows. So there is a tracheal pull here. All media signing is slightly full. It is likely to be plural effusion and the lower one, so perhaps. Now we will go to some examples. So post op mapper case. We can see a small shadow here. The homogeneous shadow in the left upper. Here we can see this is a possibly a minor fissure which is being pulled into fluid. Probably a third day, we are just getting all your items getting back to the lungs after a laboratory, which is associated with the small parts. I will go to salute site. And there is a shadow. Now there is a shadow. Heart is heart or a plane layer, or it is in a different plane. That is what is called suit. If it is going to be in the plane of the heart one day, then this border is not very clear. This shadow, I mean, clear if it is going to be demarcated, then it is called the suit sign. Then the cardiac shadow. Whichever AP is there, if that mass, this swelling, 
or this disease is not in that plane of the heart. That is what is called. Now you can see this is a complete again destroyed lens. It is uh, destroyed diaphragm, not proper again. So it is likely to be a facing. Smoker for years together, dry cough, wheezing. What is this? This patient has got a cough with expectation, with clubbing. Okay? So this is a, everything is normal. This is normal. There is no pushful. Uh, this is a very good inspiratory feeling and uh, subcutaneous tissue is normal. This angles are normal. Okay, now you can see an heterogeneous shadow of the right and the left lower zones and uh, both sides. Now you can see there is a clubbing. All these point out to couple so This actually is cut down to focus on something else. If you miss the bones, yes, you are likely to miss a cervical grip in this case. Everything is fine completely, this is pushed up. Something wrong somewhere. Yes, this is completely gut is occupying. This is the inventation of the diaphragm. All your large gut is in the thorax. It looks like everything is fine. Here, put normally repeated film, just in the here. Here, the subcutaneous issue, all these things are normal. There is a big cardiomegaly, homogeneous, and is likely to be a pericard. Five days, pretty, loss of smell, mild fever. This is ground glass opacities on the peripheries, characteristics of COVID. So what you can see here, this is not a very exposed film. The trachea is not well seen, but still we can see a homogeneous round mass. It is relatively regular in this, relatively regular in this, in the left upper zone. This we call as solitary pulmonary nodule. The primary avagla, maybe secondary also, that part. Now we can see again another. This is small. Unless we go methodical, here you can see this is not there. We cannot come and see the angles, but we can see here a small cavity. Unless we focus only after the lips into the lungs. Yes, we are clear. What is this big pilar mass? Here you can see the diaphragm is normal, trachea is normal, bone looks normal, subcutaneous tissue is normal, a big mediastinal shadow. Possibly, this is what is called saluting the heart. You can see the heart shirt frequency. Again, this skin can see there is some big thing which is slightly pushing, but trachea is not pushed. A homogeneous mass occupying the left. Red zone, lower zone, we will see what it is. The CP and angles are normal. It is likely to be pneumonia. Thus, collapse is not So, this is likely to be a pneumonia because it is relatively homogeneous. Here again, I am seeing this all these things are normal. This is normal, that's normal. Bones are normal, everything is normal, but there are small medially shadows. You can see here on both sides, predominantly in the lower zone and also in the mid zone. What it says? Yes, if this is associated. But here you can see the LA is dilated, the LA is slightly dilated, the LV looks normal. We can see this. This is a pulmonary congestion sign. This is inverse mustache sign. LA is dilated. LV comes down like this. LV is not dilated. There is a mild dilatation of that. Adult respiratory is this. This is known as well. 
rotation is normal, the case in the midline, good exposure, inspiratory insulin or psyche superinsulin. Yes, bilateral shadows. Now, if you go on to see only the areas, yes, you are likely to miss this. Like generics. To read an x ray, go systematic. Whether PA or A, rotation or not. Penetration is fine or not. Respiration, inspiration is the not. Sixth and the early with the time inspiration. Soft tissues are fine. If there is an emphysema, if there is a hematoma, bones are fine. If there is no fracture ribs. If there is no any scapular disease or anything. CP, cardiac, and cardiophonic act. So there is a chat box question. How to detect kidney B lines? Arthur, you can unmute, unmute yourself. Sir. Yes, Hello. Yeah, All these lines are now easy to find out with ultrasound. So that is the only thing. What we see, very difficult to see these lines. Only the minor fissure, like on a mild or edema, where you stick in your So you mean to say it is difficult to find only a minor fissure can be seen? Yeah, the minor fissure is easily seen. There is, if it is going to be edematous, then yes, we see that the curly B lines are slightly uh, the, the prominent. Like we can see very well in the ultrasound. Okay, but. So he has answered in the chat box because his audio is not clear. You can go through the answer in the chat box also. If the audio is not clear, we will conclude this meeting. I thank uh, our speaker, Sir Vinodini, Madam, and Martha Saradi, Sir, for a wonderful lecture for today's uh, edition of uh, Online Anesthesia. Next week, we are going to have an exam topic that is uh, Anesthesia Workstation by Dr. Sanis and uh, breathing circuit by Dr. Guru Dutt. We will meet next week. Thank you. Thank you, Nanda. Sign off from you. Thank you. We can conclude the session. Thank you.